March for our East Montpelier Town meeting. Welcome everyone to the meeting. Um, my name is Michael Duane. I'm the moderator. Um, please have a seat if you'd like. Um, we have a request from the select board to allow the school directors for the new Washington Central Supervisory Union School District to present information. Um, there was an there was an annual meeting for the school last night, but they wanted to give some information this morning. It's not on the warning. It wouldn't come under other business. Perhaps, maybe it would, I'm not sure. But um, the chair of the select board asked me that if the electorate approves of that presentation, that it be limited to one half hour, which I will strictly uh, keep to at their request. And so the question is, um, does the electorate uh, wish to allow the two school directors that represent East Montpelier on Washington Central to present information before we begin the uh, articles of our town meeting? Alice Agnew. I move that we allow them to do that. So there's motion by Alice to allow that. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Janice Waterman. Uh, any questions or discussions regarding that, Richard? Okay, girls. Oh, and um, our, our two runners today are uh, Amelia and Elise from our Girl Scout troop who are going to run with the microphone. Can I suggest that, it, uh, that this presentation be done after the town meeting? You could suggest that. Any other questions or discussion? Uh, Mrs. Knaver. I would also um, prefer to have this after um, town meeting or during other business. There was a meeting last night, and um, I know Callis had their presentation from 9 to 9.30 today before town meeting, which I think is a great idea. I think that if this body uh, wants to hear this now at 9.30 to 10, um, and that's what the voters decide to do, um, that next year um, the school board tries to get more people to go to their annual meeting, which is held the day before. Uh, it was held last night at U32. I don't know how many people went. But maybe their focus should be on getting more people to that meeting. Um, and um, I would strongly suggest that we hear this after because right now it's getting on 25 or 10 and it's gonna be, before it's all said and done, an hour and um, there's lots of town business to discuss. So I would support your suggestion, whatever it is, that we do this after town meeting or um, during other business, thank you. Any other comments, questions with respect to Ms. Agney's motion to allow that to occur now and Richard's, I'm gonna call it an amendment to do it under other business. Any other questions or discussions before we vote on those two matters? Uh, floor, yes, thank you. I just have a suggestion. Would you guys wanna just watch the slideshow that we typically done at the beginning of the meeting? And just set the tone for your entire meeting, and then we will be available for questions if you have questions up about the budget. Um, Our principal, you know, everybody, the kids and the principal preparated some a slideshow of just show you what this what we've been doing all year. Okay, I think that's incorporated as part of uh, Alice Agnew's motion to allow that to proceed uh, for the half hour time slot if necessary. Any other questions, comments, discussions? We'll take it in order. Um, Richard's motion, which is an amendment. Um, all those in favor of Richard's motion to uh, have this presentation done under other business, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Nay. <sighs> I'm trying to not take time. Um, Could uh, people in favor of Richard, uh, Richard's motion to have this under other, other business please raise their hand and uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm gonna try to count. So leave your hand up please. 
This is to come under other business. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, right hand side, under other business. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14 plus 13 is 27. Okay, all those opposed to Richard's motion to do this under other business, please indicate by raising their hand. Opposed, this is, this, this is then for, therefore come under other business. Hands up, thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Okay, so, um, 19, 20, 27 in favor, 19 opposed, the amendment passes, and so the presentation will happen under other business. And my goal is to move this uh, meeting along, so thank you, and we go to Article 1. Article 1, election of officers. Under state law, there could be no speechifying on the floor with respect to election of offices that's done by Australian ballot. So I'm gonna read the uh, names of people whose names are on the Australian ballot for officers. Uh, polls are open from seven to seven. Um, Tom Moderator, Michael Duane, right here, present. Casey Northrup, select board. John Jewett, running for select board. John is there. Uh, Amy Willis, running for select board, right there. Amy, thank you. John Boucher, running for uh, first constable. Is John present right now? No. Nope. He's out in the parking lot. Um, auditor, Carla Ocasco. Carla, are you here? Carla is running for auditor. Lister, Rob Chickering, sitting right there. Planning commissioners, there are three, and I have a small announcement. Um, Claris Cutler is running for planning commission. Is Claris here right now? No, don't see Claris. Scott Hess is running for planning commissioner. And Sue Tiplam, is Sue here for planning commissioner? No. Um, Julie Porter advised me this morning, and I think I saw this on Front Porch Forum yesterday or the day before, that there's a vacancy on the Planning Commission that came up too late to include it as a, an elected office on the ballot, and so it's up to the Select Board to appoint that Planning Commissioner. So there's a notice, uh, it was on front, front Porch Forum, but here's a notice right here, probably posted at the town office, I assume, Anyone interested in being appointed and being on the select board, please uh, get in touch with the select board on the planning commission. Please get in touch with the select board of the town clerk for further information about how to do that. So that's the Australian ballot for officers that are running um, and the polls are open until seven. That's article one. Article two, to hear the reports of several town officers and that and act thereon. The report this year is from the select board. Is there a motion to hear the select board's report? Michael Dworkin makes that motion. Paul Erlbaum seconded it. Chairman Gardner, would you like to present the select board's report, please? Oh, well, Alice. Because uh, our wonderful girls. Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you, Girl Scouts. <laughs> Mr. Gardner. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm gonna go through the select board report um, quickly, but please stop me at any time to ask questions about anything I go over. I've been accused of droning on and on, so, <laughs> so I'm gonna try to speak quickly <laughs> and correct my past bad behavior. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, turn to page 12, if you would. That's where the select board report is written. Um, so, first paragraph I'm not gonna go over. Does anybody have any questions on that? That's basically what I call blah, blah, but whatever. <laughs> so um, the second paragraph actually is somewhat important. Um, we've had quite a few people step down for one reason or the other from the various town boards. I just want to mention their names. Um, Rick, Rich Curtis, Carol Welsh, 
uh, Kim Swayze, uh, Sandy Conti. Um, there's a few more too. There's Gene Vissering has stepped down. Uh, Gene Troya is going to be leaving the select board. Um, Phil Pines left the recreation committee. So those are just a few. Those are most of the people that have stepped down. I'd like to give them a little recognition for their many years of service. They've all stepped down because they've got other things going on in their lives. Working for the town is usually done gratis and a lot of work. So that's just what I'd like to say about that. Um, Thank you. Um, so then the next paragraph just says about we've upgraded the town office, put a generator in, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions on that paragraph? Um, and then, of course, I bet people have some questions where the parking ride is finally finished and we will be working on the sidewalk project this summer. Um, any questions on that, those projects? Then the other par next paragraph deals with the road. Any question on the roads stuff? Um, I'll just address one thing on the roads. I'm sure that people have noticed the roads are bumpy. Um, the old grader has been traded in for a new one. We're not using the old one, it's got some issues. The new one has been delayed. It will be here soon. So I see a question, a hand up. Yeah. So those of us who live down on um, by U32 in that intersection by Town Hill and Fraser Road and Gallison Hill Road have had concerns for many years about that intersection because since they right. paved it, it got Richard, really put, dangerous. Rachel, put the microphone a little closer. Sure. Thank you. And so um, it might have been two years ago now. Yeah. Um, Bruce got a grant and we hired some consultants and we looked at a gazillion different options to make right. that safer. And um, we met several times, and nothing's happened. So I'm curious about where that might be at this time. That's pretty much as you've observed. As you have observed, it hasn't gone anywhere. Um, we tried to pick the low-hanging fruit on that, which was keep the banks plowed back more, cut the brush cut, et cetera, et cetera. That's all that we've addressed on that. Um, we weren't really sure whether we should pursue more expensive fixes to that intersection. So that's, it's still up in the air. So would it be worth reopening the discussion with the select board at some point? Um, if you're concerned about the site there, you could bring it to the select board and we could see what the next step would be. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks for that question. Any other, oh, oh, go ahead, sir. Any other question on, on, the, on road, the roads? Road matters? For the select board? Just wanted to note, if I might, um, Carl Etnier uh, took sick the other day, said he's coughing like crazy, and decided to not be present. So that's why Carl's not here this morning. Go ahead. And, and we'll try to fill in for him as best we can. Um, I think Amy has volunteered to fill any questions that you usually put to Carl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next two paragraphs deal with budget issues. Um, and this is something that the select board deals with all the time because we're trying to keep the budget under control, which is um, reflected in your tax rate. Uh, so there was an increase this year, 3.5%, and that was driven by health insurance costs, 21,000, and the emergency service budget for the ambulance went up um, a lot also. So those are two factors in our, in our um, budget that is very hard to control. Yep. On page 25, we had an increase in the emergency services of 27%. Is there yep. any detail behind that for me? Yeah, okay, so what's going on with the ambulance service? And I can actually, we have, we printed off a slide because we had some questions about this on uh, Saturday at the town forum. And I can 
put that on, it's right in the back of me. You can just see. So those are the, the red, the red is the fire department, and the blue is the ambulance service. Okay? So the reason that the red is higher in the beginning of the ambulance service is some of the expenses got moved from the fire department to the ambulance service. So that's why the fire department actually went down in expenses and the ambulance absorbed those. So moving forward to 2020, you can see that the ambulance service is starting to take off the blue line. Yep, another question? Kim Watson and uh, Scott. Supposed to be sustainable yeah. and not self-sustainable. Yeah. Um, so you know, maybe you can tie that in a little bit why yeah. it's not. So when I was when I was first conceived, the ambulance service is supposed to be more sustainable. What's happened is the revenue that the ambulance service takes in, they put it into the capital budget, and they've bought a lot of equipment for the fire department ambulance service that the town hasn't had to buy. So they've made about a million dollars worth of money and they put that into their capital budget and they've been able to buy equipment with that. But what's happened is um, labor costs to man the ambulance, ambulances have gone up. And what they're doing now is having to move to full-time staffing, which is what's driving the increases. Full-time staffing at this point, the way they envision it, is a per diem um, pay for a worker that comes to the fire department ambulance and mans the ambulance for an eight hour shift. These are hired from neighboring uh, emergency services, people that want extra hours, and they work down there for a certain rate per hour, $18, $20 an hour. What looks like could happen in the future is they'll full, they may move towards full-time staff, which is still staffing the 24 hour a day, but those are people that would be employees of, of the ambulance service, which would be even more money. But right now, we're just moving to per diem, because they're telling us that volunteerism is down. They don't have volunteers to do staff the ambulance. And the ones that are there are exhausted from all the hours. So they feel like they've got to go to full-time staff, which is a per diem worker down there. Uh, so that's, that's what's driving the increases, 20, 25, 30% in the ambulance service. So what that's, where it is right now is it's about six cents on your tax rate, uh, which on a $300,000 house is $180 a year. That could double. It looks like it go to nine cents quickly and it could go higher. So on a $300,000 house, it'll be up to $360 a year. Now, th this is just a matter of concern. We're not putting down the ambulance service because we know they do a great job. Uh, but the budget, what it costs the town, is getting to be a lot of money. Um, we could move in a different direction. Um, we're, we're, another ambulance service could give us service in the town, and we could rent out, or they could use our facility, a bay, to park an ambulance, a satellite ambulance. That could happen. What that would do is would keep the tax rate that you pay for emergency services at a fairly low level in the five, six cents range, um, about where it is now, maybe even a little less. So if you move towards that type of model, that would be a more consistent figure that we could deal with in the years to come. The way the East Montpelier Emergency Services appears to, to be is it's gonna escalate. The costs will escalate over time, and you will see that in your taxes. Um, so that's just a thought, and we haven't explored it fully because we know that um, the townspeople do like the ambulance service in town, and they've done a great job for the town, and this is not meant to throw any stones at them. It's just that we need to point out that it's hard to manage our budget with these escalating costs. So any questions? I see a hand up there. Uh, Scott has had his hand, and... Um Mr. Mori after that. Seth, you said that the, the, um, some of the, the expenses have been shifted from the, ambulance, from the fire department to the ambulance. Can you give us a, an idea of what the true costs of the fire department are? 
Oh, the true costs of the tar fire department are what they are in the town before. But the thing is that what's, what, what, what's happened originally is they had a rescue um, operation, vehicle, whatever, in the fire department originally. In that, they were able to shift that away into the ambulance um, emergency services part, not the fire department. So that's why the line on the bar graph is tall in the beginning and it went down a bit. Just because that ship, that's, that's just a different, that's a cost that went away for the fire department. And of course, that may would, that cost would may, maybe come back under a different model. But that's still pretty incremental when you talk about the, what's going on with the ambulance service. So the cost for the fire department has not gone up dramatically then? It, well, looking at the bar graph, it went down. It went down, and, and it, it does not go up dramatically because it's volunteers that run the fire department. There are no paid staff. The only reason the ambulance service has gone up is because of paid staff. I mean, they do a great job controlling every other cost there, but when it comes to staff, that's, you know, that's expensive. Bob Morey. What percent of calls that the emergency services group goes out on actually result in transport of people to hospital, health centers, wherever they take them for services? It seems to me they go out and come back empty a whole lot of times, you know, like for a car accident I, or I think a that, fire. Yeah, I think that's in the town report. I think it's around half. Around half? It's in, the, it's in the report here somewhere. But, my, but my point is, what cost is there for going out when there's no services needed, and how much is it driving the increase of costs here? Well, I'm not sure that you could say that that was driving an increase when you go out with an empty ambulance. Well, you could, I mean, if you're going to have staff there where they go out once a day or ten times a day, it's not really going to cost you any more money. It's going to cost you a little bit more money in fuel and maintenance on your ambulances. But if you've got staff that's sitting well, in... Well, and it requires staffing, too, if you're going to be that proactive. That's true, but if you've got the staff there anyway, you see what I mean? It's the staff are there. Another question. Is East Callis a part of paying the expenses of the emergency services group? I know yes. we share with the fire department their costs. No, no, they share, with, they share with the ambulance service also. They pay for the service. And is the ambulance going beyond the borders of East Callis and East Montpelier? Is what? Is the services provided beyond the borders of East Callis and East Montpelier? Well, Plainfield and Marshfield. They Are have, they contributing to the cost yes. of the operations? Oh, yeah. yeah, if you look in the in the budget, you can see the contributions. So they pay they pay a certain amount per year to have the annual service. Based, based on what? Are they paying the same share we are in these Okay, that's, that's a good question, okay? So that's something that we've discussed with the ambulance service is how do you arrive at those figures? And the way they've um, arrived at the figures up to now is it's um, who, was, who was providing the service before, what were they charging, and what we, can we charge you? Can we charge you a lot more? It, it's not done on a per capita basis as far as we know. It's done on what, what can they pay, the ability to pay. So that's what that's perhaps could be changed. We've had that discussion in the past, is maybe a different system that was more equitable on a per capita basis. And what would be the process to request that kind of consideration? Um, well, we, we have regular meetings with the ambulance service and that can be one of the things that we bring up. We have a big meeting with Callis, a joint meeting with Callis and the emergency services every year in December. We have several meetings. And there's some things that we could bring up, we always bring up at these meetings. Well, it appears to me we're shouldering an unfair portion right. of the cost since we're hosting the facilities that they operate out of that. that and, and that is true. And that has, that has been on our radar as far as the cost goes. Good point. Reuben Bennett had his hand up over there. Uh, Girl Scouts, the front right, please. Uh, Ruben Bennett. So we're, we're talking a lot about the expense side of yeah. the ambulance service and we're really 
Bob sort of nudged up just a little bit against the revenue side, asking the question of both the ambulance goes out a lot and we only, or the ambulance only charges for transports, then there is just looking at it from a business management perspective, right? There's potential for revenue of some sort there. Um, so I guess I would encourage the select board to have that in mind as you're talking to the ambulance service. Um, and, you know, it's a tricky one because this is a really valuable service. It's a service that um, is extra valuable for those among us who are um, the least um, resource, for lack of a better way to put it. So we don't want to um, disproportionately impact folks at the bottom end of the spectrum, but, um, but obviously this is not a sustainable graph. <laughs> right. So, um, so there are some pieces in the equation that, you know, I, I think there's questions that, that you guys could be asking pretty directly at the ambulance service to say, look, like we all have to agree that this is not okay. We, we can't just shoulder this burden. No business anywhere could have their expenses double um, in three years. It's just not possible. So how do we align interests and right, how, how do we make sure that we're getting the valuable service that we need, that we're not disproportionately impacting people at the bottom end of the spectrum acknowledging that we're graying and we've got all of these other factors that go into um, to where these expenses go. The big question for me is exactly where did that million bucks worth of gear go? Um, and and I, I think that's a question for you guys to delve into a little bit, like capital expenses of a million dollars um, that result at least indirectly in um, an extreme bump in personnel costs not saying that they're related, but dollars are dollars. Um, I think that's another potentially valuable question. So uh, thank you. I, I know that this is a difficult conversation and it's probably gone round and round and round about a hundred times. Um, so I, I want to acknowledge that, but, uh, but that's a concerning graph as a taxpayer and as a business owner. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Any other questions or comments at this time regarding this particular factor of the select board's report, uh, Ellen Canadler. Um, what would be the process for the select board <clears throat> to officially or work with the ambulance service to look into the possibility of a satellite um, for a, some other group to take it over, which you were referring to earlier? I mean, how does that get started? Do we? contact the people? Does it have to be some kind of official uh, support from this body to, to ask you to look into that? Or is it just something you would do on your own to say, well, this is just getting a little, you know, we need to get a, a handle on the money with this? So um, the, this, we just started a discussion with you, and this has given us some grounds for pursuing it because we wanted to bring it to the voters in East Montpelier and taxpayers and just get some feedback on this concern. We're getting feedback. The next step would be to meet with Callis and the emergency services and start to talk about it. It could take us a couple of years to get make a different plan, but um, this, is, this is how we start the process hearing back from the voters and the constituents. Yes. Yes, question up here in the front. Just state your name for the record. I'm new to your community, Opeyemi Parham. I'm a retired physician and I suggest another way to look at all of this is that this is an aging community and that people have to take more responsibility for choices around end of life care. And it's an important statistic to remember 15% of people who are with the best of care, you fall down in front of me, I know CPR, we have the electronic defibrillator, 15% will survive. People don't know that statistic and there's a way you can impact this cost on looking at how people are requesting services in the first place as well. Thank you. Yes. Right here, 100 Girl Scouts. 
Uh, so Bruce Howlett. Bruce. Uh, so recognizing that the ambulance service provides a service that we all value, maybe not today, but someday, and that the issue is to provide paid staffing, and that seems, I understand that seems to be necessary. And the way to pay for paid staffing is to have a sufficient population of clients, as it were. And one way to do that is, as you mentioned, is to become a satellite of a regional, of a regional service that exists, like Barrier Montpelier, obviously. But has anyone looked into creating a broader regional ambulance service in northern Washington County, so not just us in Callis, but actually forming a uh, union for this with Marshfield and Plainfield, who we're already working with? That, that's um, been a thought on, on the board. As what we're doing right now is we're sort of serving as a regional service, de facto, however you want to call it. Marshfield, Plainfield, Callis, and New Montpelier. The only thing is that that ambulance service is piggybacked on a pretty low population. So you take a Barry Town ambulance service, it's got 14,000 residents, they can afford to pay for ambulances or whatever. The service is spread out among more people. In East Montpelier, 2,500 people. So it's expensive per resident. So that's where you, that's where you go. Yes, it, regionalization makes a lot of sense. Uh, we've talked about this endlessly, even on dispatch. This batch is expensive, and but there's no regional system. It doesn't even make sense. But because Vermonters are independent and they've always had separate communities, it's a hard hill to climb when you talk about regionalization because then you're becoming independent of those small communities and that's Matley resistance. We see it everywhere. And I understand that. It's just that regionalization is slow to come to Vermont. So there you go. Anything else, Seth, on your report? I'm sure there is. Oh, there's another question. Thanks. Paul Erlbaum. Right there. Uh, if we were to contract with some other provider of emergency services, is it a fair guess that the response time might be affected? And that's, and that's our biggest concern, is you don't want to get less service even though you're saving money, it's the response time is the driver. So we wouldn't even do it unless we could use the existing facility as a satellite operation. So that, of course, would be in the mix because response time is important. So that's, that's my answer to that, and we'll see what happens. Okay, continuing with the report. So the last thing I think we've done, the budget is, um, and you can see what the budget's driven by, and uh, we're trying to manage it as best we can. Um, the last paragraph deals with Bill George, who unfortunately passed away, um, untimely passing, and also we lost Marty Miller, who was a great contributor to the town, moderator for many years, so two people have passed away in town that we will miss a lot. So maybe a moment of silence for these two citizens would be appropriate, and I know I will miss them both. So I think that's what I'm gonna end on, a moment of silence for these two people, and uh, I can always address any questions later on if anyone's got questions. So thank you. Well done, Seth. Thank you. Um, I, and I also did want to note, um, since we're on town reports, um, on our vital statistics, there is a list on page 61 of um, uh, the deaths, and we had births, and we had marriages. And in particular, uh, just as a personal note, I wanted to uh, remember Marty Miller, who uh, encouraged me to, and along with Edie, to run for moderator, did a lot of arm twisting, and I appreciate him doing that. Um, and under the people who passed away, there were many frequent uh, attendees of town meeting who are listed there. But we also have births and we also have marriages. So we're moving on. Um, the question now with respect to Article 2 is, shall the town accept the report of the select board? It doesn't mean you're um, um, agreeing with everything in there 100%. It is uh, basically non-binding, but formality is, shall we accept the report? 
Uh, and there's been a motion by Ginny Callan, and there's a second by Don Welch to accept the select board's report. All those in favor uh, under Article 2 of accepting the select board's report, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. The ayes have it, and the report is accepted. Um, Article 3 is an Australian ballot item on the budget. Uh, unlike election of officers, uh, this Australian ballot item can be discussed on the floor even though there is voting taking place in another room. Um, Seth touched upon the budget, but with respect to Article 3, are there any questions or discussions regarding the town budget? Which shall be voted by Australian ballot. Hearing none, seeing none, pulls a rope up. Was there a question? Okay. Uh, we'll take a question. Renee. Hi, Renee Kiva Kyler. Is there any way we can influence the state or even Montpelier to fix the roads? I mean, the roads are just getting so out of control. And I know we only have control over East Montpelier, but I wondered on the way over here, as I was bouncing around, if there's some way we can influence the state. Thank you. To give us more money. Good question. Our uh, state rep is uh, here and she's going to speak um, at the end. Uh, she's going to stay for lunch. So um, Kimberly is here and she could hopefully address that question. She's also on the appropriations committee. So <laughs> she, she might have some really good answers for us, but thank you. Um, and I did gavel article three. Um, article four, uh, this is also Australian ballot, but again, unlike the elected positions may be discussed on the floor, article four. Four, shall the town raise the sum of $42,022 for Kellogg Hubbard Library for the support of the Kellogg Hubbard Library? Is there a motion for that? Oh, pardon me? Oh, no motion, that's right, discussion. Yes, thank you. Good morning, my name is Rachel Seneschal. I'm a development coordinator at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. I've worked there for almost 16 years. Um, I also uh, here today as a staff person is Michelle Singer, who is the new adult program and volunteer coordinator. Um, the Kellogg Hubbard Library's request is the same as last year. There's not an increase. And I, we have a new board representative. It's uh, Jennifer Micah. And our board representative for several years is Lindy Biggs, and I want to thank her uh, for all the work that she did for the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Yes. Yay. <laughs> the uh, library report is on page 70, and I don't know if anybody has any questions um, concerning our request for the library or not. But I do want to throw in one statistic. Last year, there were 34,000 additional books checked out of the children's library. Our circulation is going up. Libraries are used a lot in Montpelier. We are a reading community. And so I encourage everybody to support this bill, this article. Rachel, you take a few questions if there are any? Yes. Uh, anyone have any questions for Rachel Seneschal with respect to the Kellogg? Hubbard Library article. Anyone? No? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Article 5. And the polls will open until 7. Article 5. Shall the town authorize all property taxes for fiscal year 2021 to be paid to the treasurer without discount in two installments received by the town treasurer at the town municipal building as follows. Colon. The first installment will be due on or before 5 p.m. on Monday, November 16th, 2020, and the second installment will be due on or before 5 p.m. on Monday, May 17th, 2021. Is there a motion with respect to Article 5? Ginny Callan, seconded by Reuben Bennett. Any discussion with respect to Article 5 and the payment of taxes? Rachel Grossman. In installments. So, East Montpelier has had this hard ironclad rule since I've moved here that taxes are late whether or not they're mailed in and postmarked the day that they were due. So if it's postmarked the 15th and it arrives on the 16th, you still get the penalty. 
Um, and I just always figured that's the way it was because it's always been that way here in East Montpelier, even though the IRS says you can have it stamped the 15th and have it be late. That's just the way it was. Well, I had occasion to be reading the Town report the other day and learned from that that not only do they go by the postmark, but they're voting on whether or not to have a seven-day grace period, um, which I'm not suggesting at all that we do. But I would like to suggest that the select board maybe consider going by postmark as opposed to having that ironclad rule. A lot of people are doing it automatically through the bank. I actually ended up paying a penalty this year because the credit union was late in sending my check. And when I called the town report, everybody was busy and I didn't want to make them look and see if it had arrived. Um, so for those of us who still want to be old fashioned about it and want to walk into the post office and say, stamp this, yes, it's clear, it's the 15th and mail it. Um, I think the select board might want to consider that. That's so just, just to answer that, we, we do talk about that every year. But, <laughs> <laughs> and, but we will definitely take what you said into account. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kim, and then Ann. Well, uh, that was my question, Kim. I mean, uh, you know, Rachel, are you making a motion or is it for consideration? Yeah. Um, you said thank you for your consideration. If somebody wants to make a motion, we can certainly entertain that. Um, the article warning uses the word do, and it doesn't define what do means in terms of being due at 5 p.m. So it's up to the electorate to decide what it may or may not want to do with regard to Article 5. So can we make a motion to change the language to read has postmark on November 16th? You can make that motion if there's a second and it passes, yes, you can. Okay, I'd like to make that motion. There's a motion, motion <laughs> by Kim floor. Watson, and Rachel, is that a second? A second, and let me, correct me if I'm wrong, but Rosie, I'm hearing it as saying that um, with regard to Article 5, Article 5 be amended, um, so that the first installment will be... Has postmarked on or before... Will be postmarked on or before 5 p.m. Monday. The post office's postmark on time, I don't think so. Mr. No, Welch? this is November 16th. Okay, Mr. Welch, you might have... But, but that's the motion, to have it be postmarked. That might not work, I don't know. Rosie? No, it would be postmarked on or before 5 p.m. Monday, November 16th, and the second installment will be postmarked on or before 5 p.m. on Monday, May 17th. And so with regard to the motion, some discussion, Mr. Welch, then Ann Stanton, then Ruben, but Mr. Welch, town treasurer. As the person who uh, deals with this, uh, I think if we just added some uh, wording to that, just saying that postmarks will be accepted, that will, you, you know, that's the thing we haven't done before, but if we just say that postmarks on or before the due date will be honored. Makes Post, it simple. Po postmarks on or before the due date. The due date. Okay. Uh, Kim I, and I Kim, that language. Yes, I was going to ask Kim and Rachel. Excuse me. Uh, yes, Kim and Rachel Grossman, whether they would accept that language. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. We had Mr. Bennett up, and then Ann Stanton had a question. Ann, oh, she's set. Ruben, you're all set. Uh, floor, yes. The clarification is so postal, not postal business, because the postal business is just that clear from our town clerks. So postal from the post office, not postal business. Thanks. Yes. The presiding officer would like to speak. People who have postal mark, who use machining for their uh, mail in their office have the option of being able to change the date on that machine. So my suggestion no. would be to use 
official USPS postmarks only for this particular item. Is that a friendly amendment, uh, Kent and Rachel? <laughs> okay. Um, any other discussion, Allison Underhill? Well, at the risk of seeing naive and being embarrassed in front of my friends, I, I want to ask why this is an issue at all. I mean, why I'm addressing this to you before I. Um, because you've got six months to prepare. So why, why the last minute? Why can't it be sent out like the week before? Sorry. Yeah, but sometimes it doesn't get there the week before. <laughs> uh, Don Welch had his hand up and then wrote a chicken. I would just, just point out we have had, and more frequently recently, that you have We've had some that are postmarked uh, a week before and don't arrive until five weeks later. Uh, and I, so I think that with the, the way the snail mail seems to work is that it is not predictable. I mean, I think you can sometimes, I'm not exactly sure how it happens, but you could put it in East Montpelier post office box outside maybe, and it might go to Washington State and back. Rhoda Chickering? Oh. And then Ruben, and then Ann, and Mike. I, I understand there are fewer than 100 people out of a uh, population here of 2,500 who do automatic debit from their checking account to pay their taxes. And I would like to encourage people to do that. I have done that for years. Don Welch, our treasurer, sends a letter out uh, a couple of weeks before taxes are due, reminding us that there will be an automatic debit. And if any moment up to the very day the taxes are extracted, you would like to um, perhalt to it, you can do that. Um, and then you don't have to worry about whether or not you have the right date on your postmark, and it's easy. Uh, Ruben Bennett, then Ann, then Mike. So uh, it seems like one of the real challenges here is that lots of us have mortgage companies who are not local in Vermont and do not understand that when it says do honor before, it really means do honor before. Um, and it's interesting because this conversation went from must be postmarked, which means that you now can't pay in person, which I don't think was the intent at all of this conversation, um, to must be postmarked to, well, now it could show up five weeks later. So uh, interestingly, I think we're having the same conversation that Callis had warned, <laughs> which is that maybe what we want is to acknowledge that if it shows up a couple days late, but it's postmarked on or before the due date. That's okay. But I don't think we want to wait for the revenue forever or for five weeks. So I think we actually need to put a timer on it if we're going to do this amendment. I think we want to say it's due on the 15th. It must be postmarked on or before that and received within a week. Um, if, if we're going to make this change, because otherwise I see a lot of unintended consequences that we'll all be parsing apart for a while. No? Okay. Ann Stanton. Girl Scouts right here, Ann Stanton in the middle. And then Mike Dorkin. And then back to Kim, as I see it. Somebody said, why is this a big issue? If you've ever, um, unfortunately, had some kind of slip up or had an elderly parent and you were out of town. I, I question, it's a big issue because it's a huge amount of money. Our taxes are already pretty, you know, hard to gather the money for and if you miss, it's a huge amount of money. So the, I have a related question that not to this, um, which is how is that, how is the amount of money set because, and, and is there any recourse, is there any, can you, you know, can you grieve it? 
I guess that's a question. The 8% penalty probably is what she's referring to. It's yeah. 1% a month, it's 8% penalty. So 8%, is that statutorily set? You know, I don't no. know. I don't know. There was some. The oh, that's the maximum? And it was voted that way by the townspeople. Oh, it was voted by the townspeople mm -hmm. back in. Some Bruce Johnson is saying that the 8% penalty is set by maximum statute, and, yeah, but, and that amount was voted upon by the town a few years back. And it, and it could be changed. Yes. Um, by, the, by the townspeople, it would come to a town vote. Yeah. yeah. And Mike, we could warn it on the next year's warning. It could be actually. It could be warned next year. Yes. Mike Dworkin, you had your hand up. Girl Scouts, Mike is right there in front of you on your right, right there. I just wanted to pick up on a rather narrow point that Ruben touched on as well to be careful that in amending this, you do not make it impossible to do hand delivery. <laughs> there are many of us who find it comforting and real to walk in, hand it over, to the stamp, and I know that a mission has been accomplished. Same. So, <laughs> me too. hand delivery should be included in the options that are available. Yeah. And there are many ways that can be done, but anything which makes it impossible or disfavored probably causes more trouble than it's worth. Right. I, I don't think the uh, amendment, as friendly the amendment amended, uh, precludes the um, hand delivery of your tax installment. As I understand it, the amendment would say postmark would be recognized Yeah. Yes. It's a, I, I have. And, and, so I, right now I have installments postmarked on a before installments postmarked by the United States Postal Service on or before the date are accepted. Uh, you might want to... Uh, yeah, I, want that. I want more than that. I want uh, postmarks honored by the USPS and or hand delivery. Do you have any idea what the Okay. Uh, Kim, I think you had your hand up, uh, then Donald, then this gentleman right here, then Rick. i got to write that down. Kim Watson, you had a comment? As long as the word stays in there as or, it will, it will allow hand delivery. And also, just to expand upon, there's a lot of younger people in this community that are using mortgage companies that are paying their taxes, and this allows for that slip for, not, for them postmarking it um, on or before November 17th, because they often do not send those checks out until that date. Don Welch, you had uh, your hand up. Then Rick Barstow, then the gentleman next to Kim. Don. Again, as the person who has to use this, I think the way the language was done doesn't change anything that works here except that we will recognize a postmark. Uh, and it's very rare that we don't have all that many. There's maybe one or two per season that might fall into this. Uh, and, uh, and it does affect sometimes the, uh, and it will affect the uh, uh, escrow companies who have missed the dates and, but then usually end up paying the, the interest or penalty, whichever it is, out of their own pocket. Okay, um, Rick Barstow. Yes, this is a, just a minor question going back to what Rhoda said about electronic deposits. I'm just wondering if there's any financial benefit or penalty to going through the bank in terms of charges or, or maybe writing a check is more costly to be processed than, than doing electronically. So just want to see if there are any better, you know, what the pro, pluses and minuses are to methods of payment. Mr. Welch, can you answer that question? We, we have no charge for checks, cash, or this direct deposit that Rhoda, that Rhoda mentioned. Uh, that one is, I think, the most efficient way to do it, both for me and for the taxpayer, because you can't be late as long as you've got the money in the, in the account, and it will, be, it will go on until you say, don't do it. But it's, it's pretty efficient, and it's, 
pretty, I haven't had any problems with it. Okay. Um, gentleman right there, right in front of you, Girl Scouts. Ken Hertz here. Ken. Uh, I wonder if uh, the, uh, the, the postmark and so forth could be, I wonder if the, uh, if the postmark requirement and so forth could be moved to the penalty, out of move it away from the due date and move it into the penalty requirement, so that um, the due date remains as originally stated, but there's penalties allow uh, the penalty requirement allows you to not charge a penalty if the postmark says it should have been here by then. That's a thought. I don't know if anyone has the answer to that question. Ellen Knadler, you had your hand up right next to you, Girl Scouts. I just want to make sure that this isn't going to goof up the um, people who are having electronic transfer because we're talking about a postal date, official U.S. postal date, but um, I just want to make sure it doesn't goof that up in case there's a snafu with the bank transferring the money to the town. I don't know how, how you incorporate that or if this does incorporate this. and. Um, Perhaps on a later note, we could just change the date to say it's two days before, but it's really the two days later. <laughs> Some trickery here. Any other questions with regard to uh, the motion by Kim and seconded by Rachel? I, I have it written, and then the select board's here listening to this, Mr. Welch is listening to this. I, I, I'm not supposed to get into the, any kind of role. I, I just don't see the town clerk not allowing somebody to walk in and pay their taxes. Because I, and likewise, I, I like to walk it in. I, I have, as a, as a separate sentence, installments mailed and postmarked by the United States Postal Service on or before the date will be accepted, period. Any other questions with regard to the motion to amend Article 5? If not, all those in favor of amending Article 5 to add a sentence that reads, installments mailed and postmarked by the United States Postal Service on or before the date will be accepted, period. All those in favor of that uh, amendment, uh, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have passed Article 5 as amended. I'm not going to bang the gavel because, Ann, you might have something to add. Go ahead. Ann Stanton, right here, Girl Scouts, in the middle. I defer to your expertise on Robert's rules, but I would like to um, move that the penalty rate be changed from 8% to 4%. I don't know how long ago it was made 8%, but my guess is, seeing how the taxes have risen, 8% is a lot more than it used to be. I have an answer. Uh, it's not germane to the uh, motion we just passed. And since it involves finances, it's out of order. So, uh, but we could petition Anyone could petition, the select board on its own volition could petition to do that, and if people are interested enough, they could petition the select board to put it on for next year's warning as it's something that has been voted and involves finance. So uh, Article 5 as amended having been passed, I'm gonna gavel Article 5 done, and now we're moving on to Article 6. Um, yeah, uh, and, and just, I've mentioned this before, the gavel is not just a little nicety. Uh, when, you, when you gavel an article done, that's it. So uh, you know, in a, a half an hour from now, someone can't say, I move that we go back and revisit. No, the only way to change a past warrant article is to file a petition for reconsideration or go to Washington Superior Court. So Article 6, shall the town raise the sum of $4,000 for the Four Corners Schoolhouse Association for operating expenses during fiscal year 2021. Is there a motion to approve Article 6? Rachel Grossman, seconded by Paul Erlbaum. Any discussion with regard to Article 6 and the Four Corners Schoolhouse $4,000 appropriation 
Rachel Gross. Right here, uh, Girl Scouts, Ms. Grossman, right there. Thank you, and thank you for recognizing me. I had no idea that my comment last was going to spark so much discussion. Um, and hope, I'm thinking this is the last time I'll get up today, because everybody's getting sick of me. Um, but I wanted to just take this opportunity to thank the town for its support of the Four Corner Schoolhouse all these many years. Um, I've had the privilege of serving on the board for 10 years, maybe? I, I don't know. But it's been a long time, and um, I just want to brag for a minute about the board, not me, because I just do the scheduling, but the rest of the board, um, the care and love that this board puts into the building, this wonderful historical building of our town, is just amazing. Um, we have people with skills on the board who take care of the physical board, the physical building from buttoning it up, um, insulation, crawling around basements, um, checking fuel levels. I, I can't think of everything they do, but every meeting we sit at and talk about the physical issues in the building, and I inevitably will say, can we get a board like this for my house? Um, so I just want to um, thank my fellow board members for all the work that they do to put into the care and feeding of this building. Thank the town for its support, ongoing support of the building, and just remind people that it's a fabulous venue for birthday parties and other celebrations, graduation parties we've had, um, and concerts, and also it's a, it's a great venue, so come check it out and um, enjoy your building. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions, comments with regard to Article 6 in the Four Corners Schoolhouse? Seeing none, hearing none. All those in favor of Article 6, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed Article 6. Article 7, shall the town raise the sum of $9,000 for the Montpelier Senior Activity Center for operating expenses during fiscal year 2021? Is there a motion to uh, accept Article 7? Scott Hess, seconded by Rhoda Chickering. Any questions or discussions with regard to Article 7 and the $9,000 for the Senior Activity Center voted on the floor? Ginny Callan. Hi, I just wanted to say that I use both Senior Centers, Twin Valley and the Montpelier Senior Center. They both offer uh, a lot of great programs. Some are different. Uh, I love being able to drive to Twin Valley only a few miles away and I also do a lot of programs at the Montpelier Senior Center and I think they're both fantastic resources for our community so I would urge people to support both. Thank you. Any other questions or comments with regard to Article 7? Yes ma'am. For transparency, I'm not a resident of East Montpelier, but I work at the Montpelier Senior Activity Center, and I see a lot of familiar faces, many members, participants, and instructors of our center are here in this room. And, and what's your name? My name is Jana Clare. Um, Without objection, uh, Ms. Clare will speak. Thank you. Um, I want to express my gratitude for the voters of East Montpelier and all the participants who have, who have come to our center in, in all, so many recent years participating. Um, we are seeing even more of you this past year. We hope to see more to come. And it's a great time to check out our offerings because next Monday we're starting registration for spring classes. There's over 80 weekly classes on offer. Many of them are open to people under 50 as well. So um, including as young as seven years old, many classes for teens, and of course lots and lots for folks 50 and up, about half of those in movement. Meals, presentations, tax clinic, uh, resource library, uh, lots to offer, and I welcome you all to check it out. And we have financial aid for dues and fees for anything that a fee is charged for um, available to everyone. So thank you again for your past support, and I'm happy to field questions if there are any. Um, I know many of you here would be happy to give a testimonial too. 
Any questions or further discussions with regard to Article 7? Seeing none. Hearing none. All those in favor of uh, adopting Article 7, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have passed Article 7. Article 8, floor vote. Shall the town raise the sum of $6,000 for Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice for operating expenses during fiscal year 2021? Is there a motion to adopt Article 8? Kim Watson, seconded by Eric Esselstyn. Any discussion or questions with regard to Article 8? $6,000 for Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor of Article 8, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have passed Article 8. Article 9, by the floor vote. Shall the town raise the sum of $8,333 as its fiscal year 2021 share of the annual ongoing costs of providing the Green Mountain Transit commuter bus service along Route 2 with service into Montpelier. This appropriation funds a portion of the total cost of the service, which will also be supported by appropriations from other towns, state and federal funds, and rider fares. Is there a motion to adopt Article 9? There's a motion by Paul Urbaum, seconded by Ken. Uh, any question or discussion regarding Article 9? No. Seth did mention something in the report about the park and ride, and that was part of the Select Board report. Seeing no discussion or questions regarding Article 9, all those in favor of Article 9 for the sum of $8,333, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have passed Article 9. Article 10. Shall the town raise the sum of $5,000 for Twin Valley Seniors, Inc., for operating expenses during fiscal year 2021, a floor vote? Is there a motion to uh, adopt Article 10? A motion by Andy Christensen, seconded by Bob Morey. Any questions or discussion? regarding our, um, Article 9, yeah, 10, excuse me, Twin Valley and Senior Center. Okay, Article 10, as I indicated. Any discussion regarding Article 10? Questions, comments? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor of Article 10, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have passed Article 10. Article 11, shall the town, floor vote, shall the town raise the sum of $7,500 for a Cross Vermont Trail Association to be used as part of the acquired local match of federal grants for the construction of a stretch of the Cross Vermont Trail, mostly in East Montpelier, including a bridge across the Winooski River. Is there a motion to adopt Article 11? Paul Erbaum, seconded by Reuben Bennett. Any question or discussion regarding Article 11, Nona Estrin? Uh, Girl Scouts, uh, Nona is right here in the front. Dear neighbors and friends, I have the privilege of um, becoming 80 years old this May. And most of my adult years have been spent in East Montpelier. Many, most, well, yes, most, working um, to create a trail system, East Montpelier Trails, and um, with the board. <clears throat> All of that time, since the first year, this bridge has been a dream. We tried and didn't make it about 20 years ago with a suspension bridge that Sandy Woodbeck designed. Fish and game had some concerns about something along the river and we lost our funding because it timed out. 
Here we are again, thanks to a different organization, Cross Vermont Trail. And Cross Vermont Trail has raised the $2 million. We've spent a lot of it on preliminary work that uh, now is ready to go. If we make this contribution, I believe it's a match for the last $50,000. It's an anonymous match, and Greg Western is here and will be happy to answer any specific questions. I can't um, possibly recommend more highly any project that uh, is near and dear to the hearts and legs and health of our town than this bridge. Uh, it'll connect, it'll bring the two pieces of our town uh, together, the west side here on this side of the Winooski and the east side together on a bridge. It's a pedestrian bridge, it's a bike bridge, it connects to East Montpelier Trail System. Finally, finally. Uh, Greg Western has this, I'd like to introduce Greg. Where are you, Greg? I know you're here. Yay. <laughs> Greg Western has done, um, if you've ever walked the Mallory Brook Trail and admired the stone stairs and the beautiful rock work that makes that trail such a gorgeous thing, it was wet as a bog when I first located that trail. Uh, this is the man who did all this through Cross Vermont Trail and also on his own raising grants because for some reason he loves our trail system. Greg West. Thanks. Um, I'm not a East Montpelier voter. Without objection, uh, Greg can speak. Hearing none. And, and I would also say there were some folks in the back who had hands up initially. I don't know if there's other folks who want. I don't know if there's other folks who wanted to talk before me. Bob Morey has his hands up. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, say what you. Tell us where that bridge is. Yeah, the expensive bridge, which will cost uh, um, plus four miles of trail, it starts at Gallison Hill Road, the trail. It goes up to U32 and then down to the river where the railroad used to cross the river, which is right by the uh, hydro dam, uh, right across the river from the Kubota dealership or Champlain Valley equipment. And then the trail will go between the road and the river for a couple miles to just before uh, Vermont Country Campers. And it'll cross the road there onto land uh, where we have an easement from um, a private property and then a uh, property the town owns. Um, and then it'll connect back up to um, Fairmont Farm and we're working with them about a, a continuation of the trail and that's in process. So the bridge is um, where the old railroad bridge used to be. You can still see the old stone bridge abutments there, right by the Winooski Hydro Dam. The reason that the uh, suspension bridge can't be used for the Cross Vermont Trail is because um, the on the north side of the river, it's and actually uh, once you get through Country Campers on the south side of the river, the snowmobile trail, the vast trail goes through farm fields or ag fields. So it can't be, it's just for the winter. It can only be used you know, when it's frozen. So um, we look at that, <laughs> and I, I was reading through my files from, again, like Nona was saying, 20 years ago. People looked at all, all those other possible ways. We looked in the 90s at having a shared trail, vast, and the, four, and the summer trail, the four season trail. Um, and for various reasons, it didn't, it didn't work out. So we started how to build just the Cross Vermont Trail, which would be a four season, multi-use, non-motorized trail and um, we've raised and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars for the design and engineering and permitting and we just received our Act 250 permit and um, our uh, all the uh, landowners involved in this um, project uh, up to U32 bridge over the river across Route 2 have donated easements or a lot of it is state land so we have permission from Fish and Wildlife and Agency of Transportation for the work along Route 2 for the construction, we have in the uh, committed over $1.2 million in federal money, which needs to be matched by local money, 
We've raised, which is a little over 300,000. We've raised 277,000 in local money, including um, 15,000 from, or 18,000 from Berlin. The trail's partly in Berlin, a little tiny bit. Um, uh, a little over 15 from Montpelier for the portion of the trail in East Montpelier. And, uh, and obviously I'm a Montpelier taxpayer, uh, but um, Montpelier has paid a lot more than that, obviously, through the trail. That's actually in Montpelier. Um, and uh, so we're, we're in the, the closing uh, last lap, $25,000 to go. Then we'll go, uh, we're, the bid packet is ready to go. We can advertise the bid and construction will start this summer. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion regarding Article 11? Rick Barstow. going down the road for maintenance or something like that. But uh, do I understand this is a, a request just for this year? Um, I believe so. Does anyone have any further insight into whether or not this is more than just a request for this year as warned? Yeah. Greg, can you answer that or Nona? Yeah, it's, it's specific to this project and it's specific to match this federal funding. So our goal is the cross on trails we work with the county across the state. And, and our goal is to try to raise money and bring it to towns rather than ask towns for money. Um, although um, East Montpelier has been very generous and you guys gave us a, a, so not for operating costs, not for ongoing costs, it's not that, it's just specifically for this project. Um, and East Montpelier has donated already a couple years ago and the difference between a couple years ago and now is the cost of steel caused the whole price to go up by hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is crazy. Uh, so that, that's why we're asking anything. Any other questions with regard to Article 11? Ann Stanton had her hand up. Ann had her hand up first. I just wanted to mention some of you noticed that the East Montpelier signpost did not have a line item this year. We had enough of a surplus that we thought we would give the town a break, and the break is at, to the extent of $6,000. So we have $6,000 less that we'll be spending on East Montpelier signposts. So it's $7,500. That's, you know. That's, that's not a motion, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's good information. Thank you. Nona Estrin. Boy, that was nice to hear. <laughs> um, I would just like to say, I'm, I think that was a great question. What about maintenance over the years? We're concerned about things like that. I can speak to that question. We have worked with uh, Cross Vermont Trail and Greg Western for years on things that didn't cost as much as this bridge, but cost $25,000 or $15,000 that we raised funds for. Every time we've partnered with them or they've decided that we have a problem on our trails that needs fixing, they raise the money without even asking us. So I have a history um, with them that uh, tells me that we aren't going to get hit up for, um, for whatever in the future. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that information. Mr. Mori had a question. Bob Mori. Hang on, we gotta, gotta run, we gotta run the microphone over, Bob, to get there volume over to this side. Over there by the door with the blue jacket, please. Thank you. Okay, Bob. I live along Route 2, and I travel that road daily, sometimes multiple times a day. My observation is that wreck trail coming out of, East Mon out of Montpelier toward East Montpelier, I have seen a total of two people using that trail in the time that it's been open. So, I'm not so sure we should be spending money to connect to a trail that has so little traffic. The other thing that concerns me is the comment about we aren't going to be tapped for any additional expenses in the future. That's the same talk I heard when the fire station in East Montpelier Fire Department building was proposed. And I just want people to think that, yeah, you could spend 7500 today, but I can almost guarantee you it won't be the end of ask requests for appropriations in the future. Thank you. Uh, Nora Duane. 
And then in the back, against the wall? Um, I'm someone who uses the trails in East Montpelier a lot. And I think that trails and mountain biking and mountain running and walking and being out in nature brings a lot of people to communities. Um, and having this connection with Montpelier and maybe you don't see me on the trail, but people use these trails a ton. And as, you know, there's a lot of talk in Vermont about young people moving in, and I'm not that young anymore, but younger maybe? Hey, today, today's Nora's birthday. Sure. <laughs> um, things like trails are a huge draw. I work at Spalding as a teacher. And a lot of the younger teachers that have moved to Vermont move here for things like trails. And that's a huge selling point. So the fact that we would be connected and we wouldn't have to leap our bodies over Mallory Brook because we love that trail is a huge thing. So people use these trails a ton. So that's just my two cents. So thank you for organizing and asking for this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I had a person up against the wall in the back. Just please state your name. Yeah, I'm Claris Cutler. Oh, hi. And I'm a new resident of East Montpelier. I moved here from Burlington. I uh, grew up in Vermont, but I just wanted to say that part of the reason why we bought a house in East Montpelier is because of all the trails. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Bob, you had your hand up. I don't know if there was somebody else who hasn't spoken. Gentleman in the back corner. Please, on Article 11. Sir, just state your name. My name is Cliff Rathburn. I moved from Barrie specifically for the trails when we were house hunting, because I lived in Barrie for like 10 years, and the property taxes, and it was ridiculous. But anyways, when I was house hunting, I moved this area for the trails and the community, but the woods, I think it's worth it. It raises property values, and it just, it just makes it a greater, better place than all the other places where we were house hunting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bob, you had your hand up. You had a comment. You're all set. Anyone else with regard to Article 11 before we vote on the floor with this appropriation, Mrs. Canadier? So you call the question. Um, is there a, that needs a second. Is there a second? No. Uh, second, Richard. Can't. Um, all right. Um, shall we proceed to Article 11? All those in favor, say aye. Of uh, proceeding to Article 11, all those in favor of proceeding to Article 11, say aye. 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 Okay. We're going to proceed to Article 11. Article 11. Seventy-five hundred dollars for Cross Vermont Trail Association has been moved and seconded. All those in favor of Article 11, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. The eyes appear to have it, the eyes do have it, and you have passed Article 11. Article 12 um, is the list of the funding request study committee recommendations. It goes from page nine on your report to the uh, halfway down page 10, and uh, there are 37 uh, individual line items. Each is a separate one, but the total is 21,000 $541, $21,541 is the um, Article 11 amount. Um, is there a motion to adopt, excuse me, 12. Is there a motion to adopt Article 12? Motion by Ginny Callen, is there a second to that? Rachel Grossman, I saw floor out of the corner of my eye. So we have a motion and a second with regard to um, Article 12 and the 37 organizations and amounts listed therein. Any questions or discussions with regard to Article 12? Yes, ma'am, back there. Thank you. Just state your name and the Girl Scouts can give you the mic. Is it on? It's on. Hi, I'm Jackie Lee Hatch, and I've been in East Montpelier for over seven years now, but I grew up here many years, moons ago. So my questions are individual. I'm not sure what Big Heavy World is, um, Circle, the two on page nine. I don't know what that involves. Um, I 
think there might be a funding committee that might be request page 79, if I may. Okay, but is, are there people here to represent? The, yeah, they're, they're probably somebody from the funding To represent, if you're asking for money, is there somebody here to represent these? I will ask, is, is there somebody here from Big Heavy World who can address Ms. Hatch's question? Is there any from, anyone from the funding committee that can address her question? Lindy, you have your hand up. Could you answer that question kindly? Lindy Johnson. Hi, I'm Lindy Johnson and I'm on the funding committee. Uh, Big Heavy World was new last year and they're an organization who is putting together uh, preservation of music by Vermont composers and Vermont musicians. And uh, they approached us last year. They had documentation of several musicians from right here in East Montpelier who are part of their project. And last year was the first year we funded them. They asked for the same amount this year. They're doing it throughout Vermont to create this database of music and support Vermont musicians. Circle used to be called the um, Battered Women's Shelter, and they have a new name. So that was the other one, was there a third one you asked about? Sir, circle's number nine, Lindy? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, Lindy's up on her feet, any other, in, uh, unless Ms. Hatch has some more questions. Uh, feel, please feel free, anyone. Um, anyone else have any questions about the, um, organizations listed and the amounts there for while Lindy has the floor. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Number 18. Yep, uh, we have a question about number 18. Here comes the Girl Scout with the mic. If you could just state your name, please. Hi, my name is Matt Peake. Number Matt. 18, uh, Green Mountain Transit. And I think we already voted on that, I'm not sure. Lindy, do you know what the distinction is between uh, number 18, Green Mountain Transit, and the specific warning article that the gentleman's referring to under number article nine? The number nine is the commuter bus that goes through. The Green Mountain Transit is the service for people who need rides to doctor's appointments or to senior center, various um, individuals who need transportation. We help support that so that they can um, get that ride for disabled, elderly, people who need rides through public transportation and we don't have public transportation. Thank you. Any other questions? Dave Connor. I have a centurion voice, I don't know that you might. You do have a centurion. <laughs> You, put, you don't. I won't be Centaurian then. I just want to say, um, I used to be the director of the Memorial Family Center. On this day, we tried to tell our pe people that they could go home and go to their town meeting and not have to worry about losing their pay. Many of the institutions that were on these lists right now are not releasing their people to be here who would loud and proud to explain what they're doing and how it affects our community and all of us. So I just want to both thank this community for its support for all of these organizations, but also say how difficult it is for people that are serving the many parts of the population that do that on town meeting day when they're not given a day with pay to come here and explain what they do. Any other questions or comments with regard to Article 12 while Lindy is kindly available to do so. Go ahead. Please. In response to the people coming here, when we do get a new request, we ask them to come to the committee meeting to explain what the request is, not just turn in the paperwork. So any new organizations come to the funding committee in November when we meet, explain what it's for and how it impacts East Montpelier before it's put on here. And then the committee decides if they ask for 5,000, we say no, 250 is enough. Um, you know, they give us what they think they need and tell us how many people in East Montpelier it affects or that they serve before it goes on this list. And there's a group of six of us, I think, five or six, um, who are on that committee. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or discussion with respect to Article 12? 
Seeing none and hearing none, are you ready for the question? All those in favor of adopting Article 12 on the floor for a total of $21,541, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All, all those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have it passed, Article 12. Article 13, shall the town, as authorized by 24 BSA Section 4501, create a nine-member conservation commission in accordance with Title 24, Chapter 118 of the Vermont Statutes. And as you probably saw when reviewing your warning and your town report on page 15, there is an explanation that goes on for a couple of pages about Article 13. So the question is, uh, is there a motion to um, adopt Article 13 for discussion purposes? Motion by Bruce Chappell. Is there a second to Bruce's motion? I see Mike Dworkin on a second. Uh, discussion, Article 13. Can anyone speak to Article 13? Uh, Seth, do you want to begin just yeah. briefly? Um, so this is a new concept oh, at this point. Charles Johnson brought it to the select board. He's here today. So he probably would be the most qualified to introduce you to this article. That being said, um, the select board doesn't have any dog in the fight, so to speak. We have mixed opinions about this. We've gone back and forth arguing about it. We decided to put it on the article because we thought people would be interested in the concept. And Charles, uh, we've done, done a lot of work, and Bruce Hallett, they're both here, they've done a lot of work on it, so I think they'd be best qualified to introduce you to the article. Does Charles or Bruce want to speak to um, Article 13? Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, Charles Johnson. Um, I'm not exactly sure how I got in this position. Um, uh, it reminds me of when I was in the in boot camp about 45 years ago. Uh, I was the only one in my group that had glasses, and I noticed I was getting picked on all the time uh, until I realized if I took my glasses off, I looked like everyone else. So I'm going to take my glasses. Um, this really grew out of the, um, I think it was called the Conservation Summit we had about four years ago, where uh, there was pretty strong support for the idea of creating a conservation commission. Uh, we have a lot of groups uh, in the town working on various conservation issues, and they're listed in the, in the uh, town report. Um, and we felt uh, over time that perhaps there wasn't the, the communication that was needed between these groups, that there was a redundancy uh, about issues. We have an example right now of the emerald ash borer uh, is being handled by um, one of these groups, and the other groups may have interest in them, but we're not really talking about it. So that's one thing. The other was that uh, the a conservation commission would um, help in terms of outside contact with the town regarding projects. There are uh, opportunities for uh, grant money that uh, could come to a single entity. It would be easier communication with the select board and the, and the town uh, uh, administrator. So there's a lot of efficiency that could be achieved. Um, but uh, we heard over time as well that there, this might be perceived as creating another level of bureaucracy within the town and make it more difficult to get work done. There might be a loss of identity with a certain uh, project that's, that's going on now. So, you know, we are open to uh, discussion about this. That, uh, I'm, not, I'm not pushing it, I'm just offering it. And Bruce and I worked pretty uh, long and hard on this uh, over several months. But we're not pushing it, we're just offering it as an idea that might help in our conservation efforts in the town. So uh, with that, maybe Bruce, you have something to add. 
So I, I've been in town for about five years, and I have to say, when I first got here, I wondered why we didn't have a conservation commission. And I know it's a lot of historical things, which Charles has a much longer history in town than I do. The, but for me, I mean, my, for my work, my job title is conservationist. It's what I do. And to me, the main value of having a conservation commission in town is to have a single point, a single group to, to discuss in conservation issues, the broad range of things. There's a wide range of things that count as conservation. And to, um, to be able to effecti for the, effectively bring that voice to the town. So that's really, it is, to me, it's about a stronger voice for conservation at the town level. Any questions or further discussion? Nathan Phillips, back, uh, back row. I was just wondering if uh, someone could elaborate a little on what Bruce just touched on, saying he was surprised we didn't have one, in regards to how prevalent these are. I mean, is this something we are kind of behind on? Is this something a lot of towns have and we don't? Or would we be on the new, new edge of things adopting this? Yeah, there are 100, I believe at this time, there are 120 conservation commissions across the state. And uh, uh, there is an association of conservation commissions uh, that would have a lot of information about their projects, how they work, successes and failures. Um, Helen? And then Betsy. Helen, then Betsy. Uh, this is a question that came up. Helen, with just state your name for the Oh, list. Helen Laban. Uh, a question that came up in the pre-town meeting forum that perhaps you'll be able to answer is there were some questions about setting up a formal commission in compliance with the Vermont statute versus doing an interim process of a year of a conservation committee that wasn't as formalized and tied to a specific statute just to answer whether or not that structure added to the conservation goals of the town and then returning to it next year. So if you could, one of you could speak a little bit to the advantages of being formally tied to the uh, Vermont State Statute with the Commission versus setting up a committee for a year to, to look at these issues. Can Bruce or Charles uh, respond to Helen's question? So far as I know, there are some advantages to having a full-fledged commission under the law. Uh, the two that I can think of is, first off, there are various sorts of grants, not large ones, but for various kinds of projects that a conservation commission can undertake. And if it was an interim thing, that would be hard to do that. In addition, many of these grants, having dealt with some of the state grants on conservation-related stuff, it, those things take time. They take time to prepare the grant proposal, time to implement. A one-year time frame is really not enough to for any of these things to go forward. So my I would say that an interim commission would be limited in the kinds of things it could do relative to a, a full-on conservation commission. Uh, Betsy Barstow. So Betsy Barstow, and my question is, would this new conservation committee supplant or do away with the other groups that are already working on conservation issues, or is it more of a place where people can come and communicate? Can anyone answer Betsy's question? Charles or Bruce, perhaps? I believe in the, in the proposal, it, it uh, uh, existing, um, is, existing funds would, would remain with the, with the group that, that controls them now. Um, and that the existing uh, committees, such as the Conservation Fund Advisory Committee, the Trails, uh, not the Trails, but the uh, Forestry Committee, uh, might, be, might be kept intact. It's a, that would be, a, I, I guess, a decision of the Select Board, whether the, the committee would stay intact uh, or, or would, be, um, would, would be subsumed by the, by the uh, Commission. My hunch is that the existing committees would stay intact and do their job but would report to uh, the uh, Conservation Commission. Uh, Jimmy Callan, and then the gentleman behind Bruce. 
Right behind you, sorry. There was a hearing about this, uh, what, a few months ago probably, that a number of us in town went to at the fire station where we really kicked around this idea quite a bit. And Edie at that time, Edie Miller said, you know, we've got people that have specific interests and expertise um, on many of our committees, and that is a valuable thing for our community to benefit from. So I would just urge that if we do go ahead with the Conservation Commission, that we do keep our committees and that they play a very vital role in the direction of our town. Thank you. Sir, right here. Out um, in front. Uh, nope, right here in the second row, please. And we have a new uh, runner. What, what's your name? Hazel. Thanks, Hazel. Go ahead. Larry Fitch, um, I'm just wondering if the committees, the individual committees that exist now, have they been contacted? Are they in favor of this? And are they concerned of having their input to the select board diluted by having it routed through this conservation committee? Can anyone uh, speak to Mr. Fitch's question? Charles? Yes, we've, we've talked with, with all the committees uh, and with uh, Towns folks as well, uh, and there's generally broad support for this. However, uh, recognizing that there is that voice that, that Jenny uh, talked about that says we should keep the existing committees intact to continue the functions uh, where where people's interests really lie. If that's if that's the case. Thank you, uh, Connor. You had your hand up. Then Ellen Knadler and Bob. More. I just want to remind people on the way down here, I heard, I think somebody from the high school, maybe Jan Richardson or something, talking about the Green New Climate Deal. We have a whole new generation of people that want the planet and the, and the resources of the planet saved. And these commissions could be things that they could join and speak to the entire community through. So I'm very strongly in favor of the commission idea. Uh, Alan, before you, there was a fellow right here. You have, did you have your hand up? You're, you're good? Uh, Ellen Knadler? I would um, like to support Jenny Cowan's um, idea or request um, that the existing committees stay in place within or maybe the um, Conservation Commission is the umbrella for which they function under. I, I worry that they will lose their voice, as was mentioned, and uh, sometimes uh, bigger consolidating is not always better. Um, it seems like an awful lot of work for this one commission to undertake and with it being very difficult to get people to volunteer for commissions and groups anyway, that if we have people in our town who have expertise and interest in working on these separate committees, but not the whole thing, um, I think it's really important that we keep people involved rather than disengage the community, which very often um, some bigger commission, even though it's East Montpelier and it isn't going to be some huge conglomerate um, commission, because we're a small town, it is bigger. And it, I think it just um, makes people disconnect more, gives them more of an excuse to disconnect. And if we have these people already in place, I think we need to honor their expertise and uh, keep those committees going. Bob Murray and then Charles and then Jean. So Bob, back corner right there by the door. Then Charles, then Jean Visser. Bob, go ahead. I was impressed with the display out here that our tree committee has put together with regard to the emerald ash borer. We have people on that committee that have specific expertise in that area and have done a tremendous job of inventorying what we have along our roadways with regard to the emerald ash borer. If we defer to a committee, or I mean to a commission, how do we assure that we as individuals have experts yeah, provide that expertise to this group. You look at the range of committees that they talk about replacing. If those individual committees meet periodically every month, how can a commission meet that often to, and represent all the variety of interests 
that we have with the committees in town. I don't know of any committees that are lacking for volunteers and or getting input into the situations we have in town. And likewise, somebody said, how do you pay for this? Well, if you look at page 16, item number four, this committee, this commission is asking for appropriations for operating expenses, including clerical help. And it's going to be asked through the select board to support this effort. I'm not in favor of adding another line item to the select board's budget to replace the work that volunteers are doing in this town already. Charles Johnson, then Gene Visser. Charles is right here in the front. Those are good points. Um, uh, first of all, it, maybe this is a point of order, but the Article 13, as it's warned, says create, would create a nine-member conservation commission. That's not necessarily needed. Um, the, I could offer an amendment, but I won't, um, to create a conservation commission, because the nine members is the maximum under, under state statute. It could be three members. So, uh, the idea that this commission would replace all the, the existing committees I don't think is accurate. Uh, it, the, the existing committees could exist, could make recommendations to a smaller smaller commission. They could be, they could be like a, um, a working committee that would carry on some of the more detailed work uh, that's needed. So it's, it's not that these aren't replacing, I don't think. Uh, so I don't know how you what would how you would handle uh, the way the article's worded now. Uh, this would tie us into a nine, seems to me it would tie us into a nine member commi commission. Gene Pissering. So I am um, strongly in favor of creating a conservation commission. I think it's something that is really appropriate to our town. I. Um, I don't think it should be an umbrella organization for all of these. We, these committees all do important things. There is a lot of other things that a conservation com commission could do in, independently of these other organizations. It makes sense for coordination, obviously, between all those committees. But, for example, we have a lot of conserved land. We have a lot of land that isn't conserved that we know very little about. And it's one of the things the conservation commissions do. They can get grants to inventory the value of some of these lands that we have, so that, for example, the planning commission, trying to decide which lands should we include in a more protective zone, it would be helpful to know. Are some lands more valuable for others, provide um, different values for, for the town? Um, perhaps areas around rivers, whatever. But this would help us make decisions when, a, when land conservation opportunities become available. What are some of the real conservation values of these aside from just being open, open land? So I think, it, I, I think there's a lot of roles for, for conservation commissions that could be really helpful for us as a town to understand our town better, um, to appreciate the town better, provide educational opportunities that don't uh, have, for example, on the um, Emerald Ashbor Committee, which I'm still a member of, um, we began thinking about invasive species but, and the quality of those roadside environments. Now all we're doing is removing ash trees. It's, Unfortunate, it's something that needs to be done, but it's not really looking at the, 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 the bigger picture of those roadside environments. So. Anyone else uh, want to speak with regard to um, Article 13? Yes. Brian, correct? Yes. Yes. Brian, yes, Brian Topar. Um, just a couple of words of clarification. Um, the statute quoted on page 16 says very clearly that a conservation commission may 
request funding from the select board. I think that's entirely discretionary the way this is worded. Um, and then on the question of the existing committees, my understanding of the proposal here is that it would be up to the discretion of the members of the existing committees to decide how they would choose to relate to a new conservation commission. And I see uh, Bruce nodding his head yes on that one. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments? Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, hang on, Bob. Um, no, someone else had. Uh, Erica, is that Erica? Yeah, Erica had, had her hand up before you. I'm sorry. Erica Zimmerman. And then Bob. I just, that Erica Zimmerman, I just want to add that I was concerned um, too about replacing committees. And at that hearing a couple months ago, was reassured that um, that was not necessarily the case. I just want to reiterate that. Um, also, I've brought up some issues in the past that haven't had a place to go that relate to land conservation, pollution, non-point source pollution, all sorts of things. And um, some don't, despite all the number of great committees we have, there are some topics that cross over them and that don't have their own committee. And this would give those kinds of issues a home, I believe. Okay. Anyone else have any brief comments or questions with regard to it? Uh, Nona had her hand up, and then Ellen Knadler. Nona, and then Ellen. Before we move to a vote, if that's what we want to do, or any amendments there, too. Brief comment. We've gone uh, from just a few miles uh, on Fairmont Farms to a huge uh, network of about 18 miles. And we're kind of busy with that, and we don't have any time to notice the grants that are flying by and are being taken um, to various different places in the state. Uh, I think a, a group like this would probably have their ear to the ground for grants available. And there are a number of different areas, uh, such as Jean suggested, that the committees could use support, uh, you know, we wonder, you know, sometimes how much we're missing that is important to us. So uh, we have been uh, in support of this idea, uh, Ellen, being East Montpelier Trails. Thank you, Nora. Ellen, anyone else before we'll um, I just wanted to ask uh, Jean, if, if, are you seeing this as a, kind of a side-by-side -side with these other, yeah, that, that sounds like a really great idea that, um, I mean, obviously, they're, they're going to work together at some point, but I think if it's a side-by-side, -side, rather than the commission being an umbrella to all of them, um, I think uh, that's something that I would support. So thank you for bringing that up, Jean. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I've changed my mind. I, 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 <laughs> I'd like to offer an amendment uh, to Article 13 and strike, create strike a nine member and just say create a conservation commission. It's a motion by Mr. Johnson to amend Article 13 to strike the words create a nine member and leave it still as conservation commission. Is there a second to Mr. Johnson's motion, Scott Hess? We are going to uh, have any discussion on the amendment before we vote. And Eric, you have a question or comment on the amendment? Okay. Eric supports the amendment. Yes, any other questions or comments on the amendment to just have Conservation Commission rather than nine members, Betsy? And then Edie. Miller. Charles, how would you feel if it just said up to a nine member? Then it would leave up to the discretion. Yeah, statute says three to nine apparently. Betsy, does that satisfy your concern? Edie Miller, this is on the amendment to go from nine down to um, commission, which has to be in accordance with the statute, which says three to nine. Correct. Okay. Edie um, Miller. Can anyone address whether uh, creating the commission under the state law, as this amendment, as this article suggests, does that create any limitations or boundaries that we don't want to have? 
Anyone have any insight into Edie's question about whether or not acting pursuant to the statute creates limitations in addition to opportunities? Can anyone think of any response that they know of? No one has in-depth knowledge of Title 24? <laughs> Alice Agony? Yes, Alice Agony. Alice Agony, and uh, my question is a follow-up to Edie's, I think. If we try this out and it's wonderful, great. If we try this out and we find barriers, can we, as this community, uh, vote to do away with it? I would say the answer to that is yes, based on pursuant to procedures of petition and warning, of course. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Bob. Bob Murray, back by the door, uh, blue jacket. This proposed commission is under the leadership or direction of the select board, I believe. Is that the proposal? The answer is yes from the chair of the select board. Yes. <clears throat> then I would like to know what the select board has for expectations of this committee. Do we have a defined set of expectations by which we can see whether or not this is working? This proposed article doesn't present a clear outline of what's going to be done. It says it may do this, it may do that, it may have committees, it may not. I just think we need more information to make an informed decision before we leap into a four-year commitment to do something. Can I have the select board respond? Sure, if they can. Mr. Gardner? Uh, as you say, it, we do not have that clarified on the mem a number of members or the expectations. This was just a concept, and from the concept, we would move to uh, establishing the commission. But we needed to hear, of course, from the town to find out if they even wanted to pursue it. So that was the first step, was does the town want to pursue this concept? And then from these guidelines, we would develop the commission. <laughs> Uh, as I said in the beginning uh, about this article, the select board never had a clear um, mandate whether they were going to support it or not. They, we just put it on the warning. We wanted to discuss it. We knew Richard would be, we hoped Richard would be here and Bruce Hallett. Um, there is some discussion among the members of the select board, pro and con, about the commission, just like most townspeople have. So that is our position. We want to bring it to the voters and see where it went. If I may interject, Bob, that was a good point because I was going to ask before we voted or even after, you know, uh, based on what Seth had said earlier, does the select board have a sense of the meeting with regard to how this vote may or may not go? And I think that answered that question. So thank you for raising that. And I think- You could petition for that. I guess the old adage is, is that this is the warning right here for 2,500 people who can or cannot, and there's, we've had so many debates about it, uh, arrive today and whether something can or cannot be put on a uh, ballot. So it could be petitioned to be brought to the select board to have something like this in the future brought to um, uh, Australian ballot for balloting, but right now it's on the warning and um, that's where we're at. That's just my comment. And you had a question, and then Floor had a question. So let's go Floor, and then. Go, go. If you stand up, and then go ahead. Go ahead. Um, hang on, Nathan. Hang on. So. We can't, they can't hear on that side. Just you state your name? Tim Fraser. Tim, go ahead. Thank you. I just disagree, and I agree with what Bob has said on a lot of things. There's too many people out here, 
And if all you do care about the land and property, why is the town selling our land that I thought was for the future in the city? Listen. Quiet down then. Go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. The people couldn't hear what you said. I was just making a comment on what you said about yeah. it. This just came in the mail. I agree with Bob. I believe some things are getting thrown under the rug. So if everybody in here cares about land, cares about trails and this and that, why are we selling our land that we just bought last year? I don't have the answer to that question. I brought it up to you. Why? Okay. Well, I just got it in the mail. Oh, I know. The stamp was late. It takes about 10 days to get there. Yeah. Does anyone have a question with regard to Tim's uh, or response that's, to Tim's question? That's my point. You're asking me about it. You're on the committee. You have every committee for every single thing. How oh, do you get together? Nothing against it. I love you, Bob. I owe you lunch. I am so for every trail. You ask me to maintain trails, work on trails, something like that. Common sense. I didn't go to college. Why would you build a trail on the left side of the river when all the other trails in Montpelier are on the right? Why should we put all this money into it? It makes no sense. 1425. That's my address. Just spend all your money. I mean, if you want to make it, I'll give my shirt off my back to anybody, but it makes no sense what some of you are doing. Listen to Bob. He's fine. Any other questions or comments with regard to Article 13, floor, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, excuse me. Thank you, Richard. The question is, shall Article 13 be amended to strike the words nine member and go to Conservation Commission and keep that language? So that's the question on the amendment by Mr. Johnson. Any other discussion on the amendment to change the language from nine member to just conservation commission. This is on the amendment, not on the substance of Article 13. All those in favor of amending Article 13 to strike the words as warned, create a nine member, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed to the amendment, please indicate by saying nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and Article 13 is amended to read, shall the town as authorized create a conservation commission, etc. Now back to the main question. Shall Article 13 as amended pass a person next to Nathan had her hand up? Just state your name, please, and in floor. Yes, my name is Gail Johnson. I just moved here from Hardwick this fall. Hardwick, Vermont, obviously. Um, with respect to the listing of what the uh, pr proposed uh, Conservation Commission would do, um, I don't, I, I'm reading the list of the items and I don't see that they may do it. I see objectives, you know, the way it's worked. Let me get my glass. Make an inventory, make and maintain, recommend, receive, these are objectives, just like you would write on a lesson plan for a school lesson plan. They're not may, okay, they are objectives. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, um, Floor, you had your hand up in the front corner, please. Someone back there had their hand, yes. I, I had a similar point that I, I see this commission as being advisory when we worked a, a one of the first things I did before coming here, we worked in urbanism in Europe, and to do master planning, you have to have uh, this type of commission to be able to, to coordinate, and it's pretty much, it's a relationship the way that they post it, and I know that Montpelier, Wastefield, and several other, Stowe has one. They, it, the way they do it is to get more citizens involved with their natural resources, so it, it does create kind of an umbrella, but it's powerful because you can do more master planning, and it's advisory. They can't really, they don't have any powers, advisory. Uh, person in the back, then Ruben. Can you just state your name, please? And then Mr. Kate after, Paul Kate after me. 
Hi, my name is Gianna Petito. I just wanted to voice my support for the creation of a conservation commission as someone who works professionally in natural resource conservation work and professionally with other conservation commissions across Washington County, Shipman County, and a few towns in Orange County. Um, I, I would reiterate that there are a lot of concerns, natural resource concerns that just aren't quite met. There are gaps, there's a lot of opportunity for work in water quality and stormwater. Um, that we don't quite have a house for and a home for that specialized expertise is not quite there yet. So I'd like to reiterate support for that. Um, I also would like to say that uh, the way the language is written in here, I think creates some flexibility for the commission. And I don't think I would support more stringent language on specifically the tasks that would be at hand because natural resource concerns are ever evolving. Um, and things are always coming up that we start to see new threats, changes. Um, so I would support a more flexible language to what this commission can address. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reuben Bennett, and then Mr. Kate, and then Zoe. Reuben, right there in the front, please. Thank you. Uh, Reuben Bennett. So um, hearing all of this, uh, it's, there are a bunch of committees that do a bunch of very specific work in town. And uh, it seems like the my my fingernail deep summary of this is that this appears to be the uh, commission or organization that the town could form that going to Tim's point would sort of bridge all of the silos that are in place and give that one place for all of this information to pass through. And I actually think that's a really good idea. We all get a little myopic. We all get a little focus on the things that we're doing. And having some little more broad scope, hearing that there are things that are happening in town that there's no place to go to that are conservation related. Um, and, and hearing this sort of idea of an umbrella that betters the communication between these different organizations just sounds like a win to me. There's no cost. Um, there's really no risk. We can disband this if we decide that it isn't working. Um, so I, it sounds to me like this is something that uh, we should give a shot. Thank you. Uh, Paul Kate had his hand up in the back. And is that Zoe Christensen? Yes, you'll be after Paul. And then Julie. Thank you. Mr. Kate. Thank you. I wonder if this addition of more bureaucracy, if you will, is going to be worth the difference in how much we're going to gain. I think there's this talk about doing things because it's going to make it more efficient, but we're going to create more bodies that have to keep track of each other. And I, sometimes there's trouble getting enough people on some of these committees. And these committees tend to be set up to deal with a particular issue. And so people who are interested in that issue <coughs> join the committees. Well, we're diluting that in a way. And I happen to be on a couple of these groups. And I'm just wondering if I'm not particularly interested in spending a bunch of time dealing with, with uh, other things that don't interest me as much. I'm trying to do the job for the committee that I'm on. And so it makes me think, well, maybe my time has gone by. I'm not, you know, not to say that there aren't some things that are, could be positive in this, but I'm not sure that it's a win-win all the way around when we uh, try and get that many more people involved. I'm all in favor of more people being involved. but. So it sounds funny to, to say this, but I think we may be duplicating more 
in the long run than, than what we're expecting to gain by this. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Um, Zoe Christensen, Julie, Helen. Zoe Christensen, um, I know that it can feel easier to take um, not strict language to figure something out like this, but um, I think the very vague wording of um, the CC may um, on the top of page 16, the may, which um, refers to all of the bullet points following, um, I think that it could be worth the while to make an amendment to make um, slightly less vague language there because the may could refer to anything and could make it potentially more difficult for the different committees to interact with the proposal. So I would like to propose some amendment to the word may. Um, I don't know what that would be. <laughs> that would be a... That'd be a... Wi okay. Will or um, could, or not even could because then it's kind of the same as may. But perhaps, you know, I think it would take some time, but to specify and say the committee will do X, Y, Z, or may do X, Y, Z, but to have may for everything is, does seem fake. Um, you know, that's um, adapted by the statute and it's not the language of article 13 itself, so I think the motion is out of, no, is not germane to the article. Sorry, not germane. I can be challenged on that. Moderator can always be challenged. As long as it's not contrary to state statute. Um, thank you. Um, um, Helen, you had your hand up. Oh, Julie. I'm sorry, Julie right here, Julie Porter. I'm Julie Potter, I'm chair of the Planning Commission. Um, last fall, prior to the uh, town forum that the select board hosted, the Planning Commission did review the proposal and met with Bruce Hallett to discuss it. And we were looking at it from a very specific viewpoint, which is, are there things that having a conservation commission that they, that they could do that would make it better or worse um, for the Planning Commission to do the Planning Commission's job. And in discussing this, we realized that there's a number of the, um, that long list of may that comes straight out of statute that just empowers saying a Conservation Commission could do those things. But we looked at those and we realized that there's a number of, uh, of those may do uh, tasks that some of them are sort of falling through the cracks in East Montpelier and would be beneficial to the Planning Commission if we had some place to go to, to say, as we're looking at the town plan and trying to figure out what should happen where in town, are there areas that have specific environmental values that should be protected? And we should have the town plan say that. And as we were trying to work through those issues, um, we did not have a specific entity in town to go to that had the expertise and felt authorized to be able to t answer some of the questions that we had. Um, so having some body that could do inventories and had that kind of expertise would be useful. Having somebody who could do environmental evaluations on an advisory basis would be useful for the Planning Commission. Having some entity to go to to cooperate with us while we're trying to figure out environmental issues in the town plan or in zoning. Um, some group that could take on some of the educational and material issues, which, for example, the Resilient Roads Committee has done an excellent job dealing with trying to get materials pulled together for addressing the Emerald Ash Borer, but that's not the only area where we might benefit from having those sorts of things done. The Planning Commission also took a look at our adopted town plan and there are over 100 action items in the town plan. 29 of them are things that would be relevant for a conservation commission to do. 
Now, some of those are being done um, by some of the existing committees, um, but there are other ones where we struggle to find a home to say, this is who should be taking that on. And by default, some of those are tasked to the select board, which has their hands full doing all sorts of other things and really doesn't have time to make sure that those projects advance. But nevertheless, these are things that in the process of developing the town plan and taking it to the community and having the town plan getting adopted, we said these are important actions to get done. And a whole bunch of them don't have a home really right now. And so having a conservation commission to provide that home and to be a resource to the other groups would be really useful. At least this was the viewpoint of the planning commission. And so conceptually, when we discussed this, the planning commission support the idea of having a conservation commission. Helen, you had your hand up? Right over here. Thanks, Helen Lehman. Um, this is just following up on Paul's point, and I think it uh, connects to this last point as well, which is that I share uh, his concern about volunteer capacity and what we're asking for from our volunteers, but I reached the opposite conclusion, which is, you know, someone like me, I have time and capacity to do manual labor on the trails, right? And Nona should call me, and I would volunteer for a committee that does that. I don't have the capacity to look at the bigger picture of how all these trails map together and what the implications are for conservation, those bigger picture questions, but someone should be doing it. it. It strikes me, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, that setting up this commission allows the volunteers and those other committees to continue to focus on what they've been focusing on while not asking them to do the additional work of environmental assessments in that long list of maze. So um, I guess I'm both noting that that should be an ongoing concern for how we use our volunteer time and that this appears to solve part of the problem of people have different capacities, different aptitudes, different things that they're interested in doing, and it allows us to find where we fit best in the constellation of volunteer work in the, in the town. Anyone who hasn't spoken on this before I call on people who have their hands up, Ed Black Deegan, and then Bob Morey had his hand up, and then Judy Callen had her hand up, this young man right here, Ed, Ed, Ed Deegan, back corner, please. The people would stand up. I think it's easier for the runners to see where to bring the microphone. Ed. Uh, you already said it's not germane to the question, but the, the uh, will uh, and shall wording becomes a real problem for the town uh, rather than may. Because once you vote on something that says will or shall, it becomes an obligation for somebody in the town to tick that box off every year that that stuff was done, uh, which falls back on Rosie and Bruce and the select board that those things are being dealt with. Uh, the May, I like the wording as far in the way it is. You don't want to box yourself in uh, on, the, on that type of thing in general. And, and specifically in this case, I, uh, you know, I know Mike said it wasn't germane anyway to the question, but I think you want to keep just your uh, box open as much as you can with this. Uh, Bob Morey, then Ginny Cowan. I'm sorry. Bob Morey, Ginny Cowan. This woman, here, what's your name? Lori? I can't tell you how disappointed I am to hear a planning commissioner say that they're letting things slip through the cracks. And to hand off something that's slipping through the cracks to another commission just doesn't seem to make sense to me. If things are slipping through the cracks, then bring that to the attention of the select board and deal with the issue. I don't understand people saying, well, things are slipping through the cracks. I've served on a number of committees, and when we had issues, we dealt with them. We didn't let them slip through the cracks. What's that all about? Creating another commission isn't the right answer. Uh, Ginny Callan, if you could stand so then the, the runners can see. Thank you. To whom? To bring the Hi, I was going to propose we call the question maybe after the next speaker that you identify already speaks. Um, and, well, um, you can only call the question when you have the floor. So you have the floor, and are you calling the question? That requires a second. Seconded by this gentleman right here. Nick? Oh, hi. Um, um, yes, sir. Mr. Ag, Mr. Angie. Um, 
Call the question means end the debate, which is a more harsh way of saying call the question. Um, there's, it's non-debatable, but it, because we are ending debate, it requires, as you know, a two-thirds vote to end debate and go right to the language. So there's a motion and a second to call the question. All those in favor of ending debate need a two-thirds. All those in favor of ending debate and the moderate voice, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed to amending, ending the debate, please indicate by saying nay. nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it with regard to two-thirds, according to my hearing, unless someone wants a division. I hope not. Um, the question is now called, and we move to the substance of Article 13 as amended. Shall the town, as authorized by Title 24, create a conservation commission in accordance with Title 24, Chapter 118? Are you ready for the question? All those in favor of adopting Article 13 as amended, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you have adopted Article 13. Article 14, non-binding business, but it says, shall the town shift the timing for the annual pre-town meeting informational forum from the Saturday preceding town meeting to a regular or special select board meeting no more than 10 days prior to town meeting. This question came up at last year's town meeting. I understand from reading the uh, select board's uh, uh, going to one of the meetings that um, this has now been put on for uh, consideration. I think it's here for, it's non-binding. The select board has the authority to do this, but since it was created by a vote, I don't want to speak with the chair. I think the select board wanted to hear from folks. And so, is there any discussion on this non-binding question about shall we switch the informational meeting from the Saturday before to a um, select board meeting prior to town meeting? Any questions, discussions? Charles Johnson. I think it's an absolutely wonderful idea. <laughs> Last year's minutes reflect that Mr. Johnson was the one who raised this point. <laughs> but any other questions or discussions regarding this non-binding item? I, I just wanted to say a couple of words on that the, the attendance at the Saturday forum has been going down every year. There was 15 people at it this year. We're hoping by moving it to a select board meeting, which is in the evening, more people may come. That's the thought behind it. We have to have an informational meeting. It kind of made sense to do it in the evening. They will get more attendance. So that's kind of the thought behind it. We're not trying to be undemocratic. We're just trying to change it up a little bit and maybe have more participation. Um, I'm going to step out of my role if I'm allowed to. I went to the select board meeting one or two of them prior to the um, writing of the warning, so I'd have a sense. I was uh, pretty impressed how much information I got going to the select board meeting prior to town meeting, because a lot of this stuff was discussed in detail with various points of view. So I don't get to vote on it, I don't get to try to impress anybody about it, but I got a lot of information going to the select board meeting on that evening one or two meetings before the town meeting. Just wanted to put that out there. Any other, dis uh, yes, Ken. Is there room? Could, if you could stand and then they can see you. Okay. Is there, is there, sorry. Ken Hertz, um, is there room at the select board meeting for attendance? Yes. Any other questions or discussion? with regard to the non-binding Article 14 before we move on. Um, we're gonna vote because it says shall, but it's non-binding. Anyway, there is a state law, let me just say this, I'm not the lawyer for the town. There is a state law that requires there be an informational meeting within a certain period of time before Australian ballot money issues come up. And this is what this would do. I'm not the town attorney. Uh, Bruce Howlett. I just want to agree with what Seth just said. Uh, Saturdays are hard for me to get there. Evenings are easier. So I think that's a good idea. 
Any other questions or discussions before we vote on Article 14? Seeing none, hearing none, are you ready for the question? All those in favor of Article 14, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have adopted Article 14. I'm gonna to try to kill about three birds with one stone with respect to lunch and our uh, able school board members and our state representative. So, other business, uh, which cannot be binding, no action can be taken. Under other business, um, I'm gonna ask, K Kimberly, are you staying for lunch? Yes. Okay. Uh, could you address the crowd for about two or three minutes and then hang around at lunch and people can speak with you and we're very pleased that you're here from our, our rep from Middlesex. So then we can go to Lindy and Floor. Thank you, everybody. Two to three minutes. My name is Kimberly Jessup. I'm in the second term as state rep for East Montpelier Middlesex. And what I thought I would do is to give a brief overline of the four bills that I was prepared to talk about. And feel free to hit me up at lunch. I also, by the way, posted yesterday on the front porch forum and included a link to my town meeting legislative report that has further detail. So the four that I want to hit are the Global Warming Solutions Act, the Act 250 Modernization, Tax and Regulation of Cannabis, and Raising of the Minimum Wage. And I'm very mindful of the fact that others also want to claim this other space. So I don't know if you want me to try to do a sentence or two launch on each of those um okay so briefly global warming solutions act in the past we've had these aspirational goals they've been in statute since 2006. what the global warming solutions act does is to give those some teeth and it does so by through the rulemaking process and creates a uh, right of action a cause for action for a citizen to be able to go and to sue the state of vermont and that is not, let me be clear, that is not for monetary damages, but rather to accelerate the rulemaking and to hit the targets that were laid out. Um, and I would just add that a number of other states have done that, most specifically our neighbor, Massachusetts. They had a 25% reduction in their greenhouse gases. At the same time, they had economic growth along the same trajectory. So plenty more to talk about at lunch if you'd like to. Act 250 modernization, that one just hit the floor and passed last week. Uh, basically what that does is seek to add a few extra criteria to what we do with Act 250, specifically things like habitat preservation, forest fragmentation, um, things that are largely related to climate change. One of the things that might be of interest since we're at a town meeting, there is going to be something that is new. It's called an enhanced village designation. And what that does is it allows a village center or a town or a neighborhood, as I understand it, to be exempt from Act 250. And there are pros and cons to that. And to be clear, it's not something that a village or town has to do. This came to the legislature from the Rural Development Caucus that represents a, a bunch of small towns and they thought this was a good idea. Um, there are a bunch more things. There are flexibility for the forest products industry given climate change. There's a lot of variability in terms of whether the gr ground is thawing, whether it's hard enough. And so there's a, a greater degree of flexibility in terms of permitted hours of operation and delivery of wood heat fuels. And that's from the period of October 1 to April 30th. Uh, there's also some language in there about uh, expanding Act 250 review within 2,000 feet of highway interchanges. That's largely because we seek to uh, make Vermont a tourist destination where you're not bombarded by billboards, and it seeks to uphold that. And then the final thing I would say, uh, since we've been talking on the issue of trails, there was a case where uh, there was a question of whether Act 250 jurisdiction applied to trails. And so there is an amendment that was accepted on the floor to this bill that would say any trails that were created after 2020 and disrupt more than 10 acres could be subject to Act 250, but 
there's going to be a working committee and they're coming back with a report in December of 2020. So there's a lot of players engaged in that and um, that it may be something that people in this room want to engage in in some fashion as well. Real quick, minimum wage. Um, you'll know that we currently have a minimum wage of 1096 on the 1st of January that would rise to 1175 and on January 1st of 2022 that would rise to 1256. In 2023, it would rise according to the consumer price index or 5%, whichever is lower. Uh, that you may recall was vetoed. Both the House and the Senate voted to override that veto. And so that will become law. Unlike one other piece, which is the paid family and minimum wage, which also was vetoed after being passed by both the House and the Senate, the veto starts in the chamber that where the legislation originated. And I'm sorry to report, because I happen to be a strong supporter of that, that we failed in the House by one vote. So that does mean that that is dead for this time, but um, we hope to see it again uh, in the future. And then um, just very short, tax and regulate cannabis. You may recall in 2018, that we allowed personal cultivation. What this does is an effort to bring a lot of that into the regulated market so that those who choose to consume cannabis can do so in a way that is safe and healthy and that there is also opportunities for small growers and others who would like to partake to engage in this state system. Uh, it does allow towns by vote to choose to opt in. That was a that was something that people really worked out um, worked out in in uh, well there was a lot of back and forth on that and in terms of the retail sales the way that it works is that we will be subject to a 14% cannabis excise tax 30% of which would be going for prevention there's also a 6% sales use the sales use tax in entirety will go to the education fund where, interestingly enough, um, it's a new experience for me being on appropriations, we put a firewall of sorts around that where we said it must go to after school programming. And I, for one, think that's really great because I think a lot of times youth are looking for things to do. And that's the reason they may turn to things that are less healthy or desirable. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up right there. I'd say there's, a, there's many other bills that are on deck. We, when we go back, we're going to hit crossover four days later. And one of those bills, there's a Bill of Rights for Older Americans, and that's really creating a statewide blueprint, trying to engage philanthropic groups, trying to engage community groups, trying to engage state and federal government so that folks are on the same page, and to create safe guardrails and to create uh, financial stability, all the things that you would want in a demographic that is expanding in that age group as Vermont is. So I personally am very excited about that and I hope it makes the crossover. And then the one final piece that I will say is in rural health care. There's been some good work on that and there are currently ongoing discussions about how to meet the shortage that we're facing for both primary care docs as well as for nurses, and I expect that we will see something out of that prior to crossover. So again, I'll be there at lunch, and I'm happy to talk more in detail um, with anyone who's interested, and I just want to also thank all of you who are in touch with me throughout the session. It's super helpful to get your feedback and all the questions and issues that you flag. So thank you very much. Thanks, Kimberly, very much. Um, I'm wondering if Laura and Lindy could do their presentation, and then when that's done, if there's uh, any other business uh, under other business, I don't know if there is, we can then adjourn uh, at following that. So that's the plan, absent an objection. And uh, Colin is calling somebody up to the front of the microphone, Lindy, um, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Oh, before I forget, hey, uh, Kimberly, somebody did have a question about paving the roads, so you might want to stick around for that question. Uh, yes. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Floor. So I have a quick proposal since we, uh, our
presentations between you and lunch it, that we show the slideshow and I'll read a brief statement. Page 20 has the budget and we're around for questions. Does that make yeah, sense? That does, thank you. And page 20 of what document floor? It, okay. That one that came up. Okay, thank you. The slideshow was put together by Alicia Lyford, the principal, to highlight the year like we've done at town meetings in the past. Because of the merger, the annual meeting was all five towns and it was last night, but we wanted a presence at town meeting. But with all the newness, it wasn't worn in that sense because we were coming around and figuring out all of this and what an annual meeting is now that we're a merged district. So there were some mistakes made that we're fixing. We're hoping to get the information back in the town books like it was in the past. That was something that came up at the last minute and we heard loud and clear that it's needed and wanted. We do have the, I have some copies of salaries and numbers of people working in this school. If people are interested in that, it used to be in our book and it wasn't this year. And we heard some people wanted it, so I did make a few copies. The salaries are actually all six, well, five towns, um, employees at the district. But Alicia put together a list of the FTEs of people working in this school. So this light show has no music, so while it's playing, just look at that and I'll tell you about the school. So uh, 
Since our merger last year, we have been working hard to develop a shared understanding of equity issues across our schools. This is the first unified budget that we're presenting in Washington uh, Central, it, where all the principals got together and, uh, and discussed what was best outcomes for all our kids. It, we have come a long way, and we're in how do we understand and we believe that we want what is best for all our kids across our elementary schools, our middle school, and our high school. This budget supports a strong, we got some questions yesterday at our meeting of what this budget supports. So this budget supports a strong multi-tier system of supports in all our schools. What is that? We're working hard across all our schools to make sure interventions are in place for getting kids up to speed on their learning before they fall behind, as well as helping kids exceed the expectations. We're supporting professional development for our teachers and giving them the collaboration and plan time they, so they can teach with intention. We're using trauma for practices across all our schools. We continue to be in support of the arts, music, and athletics plus our after school program. The budget is an affirmation of our desire as a board to have better outcomes for all our kids without sacrificing the experience that they have at school. And that's it. Thank you. And for, and Wendy said they would be here during lunchtime if anyone has any specific questions. Um, Article 15, any other business to be transacted that properly comes before the board? Yes, the town. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt Peak. Um, I just want to comment about a recent article that was in the signpost, not this one, the one before, that was about Sandy Conti that Carl had written. I guess I would like to say thank you for what you wrote about Sandy in your in your report, um, Seth. I appreciate that. Um, I don't think that it was very good what the article that Carl had written in the sign post. I think that there needs to be a little bit more scrutiny about what people write about other people in the town. Um, Sandy did a really good job more than once brought home our dog to us, um, handled issues in the town, and I just think that he was owed more than an article about going in the sign post like that. And I would just like to say that um, shame on us for allowing an article like that to be written in the sign post and everyone to read it. Thank you. Any other um, matters under other business non-binding before we adjourn? Seeing none, um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mike Dworkin, seconded by Donald Welch. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor of adjourning, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes. Oh, one other thing, under other business. Rachel Grossman, who's getting the food out, wanted to thank the town for having such a nice cover on the town report. <laughs> Absent anything else. Um, the motion is passed. Uh, the meeting is hereby adjourned at 12.13.